How do you build a high-performing culture? This is Culture Architects, candid conversations with extraordinary leaders sharing their biggest successes, failures, and lessons learned on their culture journeys. Here's David J. Friedman. Thanks for joining me as I conclude my talk with Pete Bayer, the Senior Vice President of Operations at Penske Logistics. You know, we've been talking about his leadership transition from military leadership in the U.S. Army to corporate leadership at Penske. Pete, I want to dive back in on those eight simple steps in my eight-step framework. The fourth is what I call integration. Clearly, the military is better than just about anybody at taking a new recruit and getting out of them what they used to think and beating into them what you want them to think. I mean, they are probably the world's leader in integrations. Talk to me more about how the Army does that. This goes back to your first step of define culture, right? So now you're integrating right. them into your standards, your values. Exactly. Um, yes. And, you know, the way the military does it, it's, um, you know, if you're an enlisted soldier, you go to basic training. And from, from the first moment, uh, you are stripped of your individuality and it becomes all about the team. Yeah. And this set of ideas and ideals that is bigger than you. And in the officer corps, we, we, we go through our own version of it. Right. Uh, and what you learn, it's an interesting thing. You know, one of the things I learned as I transitioned to the private sector, in the military you are raised, the more senior you become as a leader, it's about the team. It's not about you. And right. I found it very difficult as I, A, built a resume and then B began to interview, I had to use the I word. Interesting. Well, you know, when people are looking to hire yeah. you, they really don't care yeah, what you yeah. did. They want to know yeah, what they, you yeah. did. Yeah. And it Humility was isn't necessarily the biggest thing there. No, but, it, but I think it's an example of how I was raised in a culture where, you know, progressively over time, it wasn't about me. Right. It was about my team. So the integration piece is, uh, the, you're right, the military does that very well. Yeah. So the fifth step is, is I call it communicating the culture, is how do people mm -hmm. see it, feel it, see it everywhere around them? Clearly, the military does that well. The sixth step, I, I, my word for it, I call it coaching. How we use, and you described it, how we use the language of our culture in the day-to-day -day coaching. And you described earlier how often that language comes up in the training and the teaching and the coaching and the support for people which clearly helps that, that common language becomes the way we think about things. The seventh step in our overall eight-step framework, I call it the leadership example. And clearly, that you mentioned that already, that's vital that you as an officer and, and the other leaders in, in the unit need to be demonstrating these behaviors. Otherwise, they don't have a lot of credibility with your, your troops. And then the last of our eight-step framework, we call it creating accountability. How do we hold ourselves accountable to doing these things? And clearly the military does that as well or better than anybody to hold people accountable to this. Is, these are the standards we operate from. If that doesn't work for you, you're not going to be in our unit. No, absolutely. And if I could comment just on those steps. Yeah. One, I think your framework is spot on. And it's a framework that I still use in my current role. You know, this communicating the culture, as you heard me say earlier, one of the things you learn as a leader is if it's important in the military, you know, especially when you're a commander, you learn you have something we call commander's intent. You have a 30 second version of it, a two minute version of it and a five minute version of it. And you you learn to say it all the time. And quite honestly, mm -hmm. I do it all the time now as as a leader in Penske. You know, I lead all of our warehousing business units, so 6,000 associates in 70 warehouses across America. Wow. Um, and, I, you know, I, I have defined what is important to our team and say it all the time. So this, you, you have to communicate that constantly. Right. And then your actions, you know, back to the leadership example, have to match that. Um, I, I also agree with your coaching piece. You know, in the military, um, probably – you know, our best coaches are non-commissioned officers in the civilian world. Those are supervisors, mm -hmm. uh, but, but they're the ones that, you know, they're the primary trainers, the soldiers. And you, you know, it's, you, you call it task condition standards, right? So we're going to do this task under these conditions to this standard. And then you're given feedback after you do it. That's called coaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we in Penske, uh, we use a coaching model, um, that we train all of our supervisors. In fact, it's the only way we train them 
our leaders to engage with one of our associates anytime they speak. And it comes out of a book called 24-7, Building an Incident-Free Safety Culture. It's In the book, it's called The Safety Conversation, but it's a four-step model to coaching. The first is accentuate. So the first thing out of your mouth ought to be something positive. Okay. And it doesn't matter what you saw. Uh, you could have seen your associate do the most dangerous thing you could possibly imagine. Start with something positive so that you open them up to having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Then you explore, right? What is it we, you just observed? Uh, explore the issue. Then you emphasize, and that's really getting to the point of why is this important? And then the last is agree, last step. Mm -hmm. And the key in coaching, as you well know, is a leader should ask questions and probably do less than 30% yes. of the speaking and the subordinate should do 70% of the speaking. I have found that both in uniform and in my current role, uh, this is how you grow as an organization if you're good coaches. Um, yeah. And then leadership example that, you know, I think goes without saying in, in military, we pride ourselves on it. But, but I find in the private sector, it's every bit is important and maybe even more important. Well, yeah, and I, I think to your point, it, it may be more important because there's no impl there isn't the same degree of implied implied authority that Correct. we're in the military. I don't have a choice. I have to follow what you've said. In the private sector, I might or might not have to, or feel I have to. I don't feel as, I don't feel nearly as compelled. So you better be a darn good example of what you're talking about. Well, and, and you have to lead differently. What, what I found the difference between, you know, in the military, you come from a very structured, formally hierarchical organization where everybody is, you know, calling, you call your boss, sir or ma'am. Mm -hmm. It's very structured. And at a certain point, you go do something because uh, your boss is a colonel and you're not. So right. you have that implied authority. All right, we're done discussing it. Move out. Right. What I have found as the leader in the private sector, it has really caused me to have to grow as a leader because we are what I call flat, friendly, and collaborative. Mm -hmm. And the culture of Penske is fantastic. Um, it rivals uh, the army. Wow. But, but, you know, my boss, um, you know, I report to the president of the company, Mark Alth, and, and Mark is Mark. And uh, we all know Mark is the president. You don't call him sir? No, uh, I resist. Army Pete occasionally comes out just reflexively, <laughs> but I I, uh, I revert to being Penske Pete where, you know, Mark is Mark. And we are far, in order to be effective, you've got to be very collaborative. And your leadership example is different. Like in the Army, when we you would have a meeting, at the end of the meeting, generally the chief staff or kind of the number two in the room, you know, would read back all the tasks, taskings, okay. all the things that we said we were going to do. And you would assign us a, a suspense, either the senior person or the chief would assign a suspense and they were directive. There was no negotiation mm -hmm. in our, in the culture I'm in now as a senior vice president at the end of a meeting, I'll say something like, well, okay, I think we need to get a few things done. And, you know, maybe our warehouse engineers need to do something and I'll go to them. So guys, when do you think you can get that done? <laughs> it's just different. Yeah. And it's good different, right? But that leadership example, because I want them, they've chosen to come work for us. I right. want them to stay in our team. So they have to have a voice in a different right. way. Yeah. yeah. So th th this is a good transition from the military to civilian life. So as you became a leader in civilian life, you've identified some of the things that are different. What was the first thing you noticed that, wow, I'm in a new world. I'm not in Kansas anymore. I'm not in the army anymore. This is different. What was the first thing that hit you after 29 and a half years in the army and you now got into civilian life? The, the first thing was your team, you kind of, they kind of lead two lives, their professional life and their personal life. And to me, that was very foreign. So all of my um, you know, the first job I took, I sat down with all my direct reports and I was leading our largest transportation account. And I sat down with my four direct reports, all of whom were pretty senior, you know, 20 years of industry leadership. And, um, and you know, I, the first question I asked them is just tell me about you and your family. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of them tripped over their words because <laughs> nobody had ever asked them about their family. Mm -hmm. And in the army, you grow up as um, family as readiness. So you know about every, you know about your subordinates' personal life because you need to. You know, when you deploy, you've got to ensure that 
the family that stays behind is taken care of and you under, you know, and all of those type of things. So, you, so for instance, if, um, one of my soldiers, uh, when I was in uniform would drink and drive, that was ours to deal with. Uh, if that happens to one of my associates here, i we may not even know about it. Right. And even if we do, it's not ours to deal with direct report subordinates referring to their wife and kids in the third person without using their name. Just very diff- not personal in that regard. And, you know, I grew up where you're family and you want, and if you want to build a team and in the army, you do a lot of team building things that involve families, right? A lot of social events and those type of things. Well, it was very, that was a shock to me. Um, and it I, still I, is. I would have guessed the op- I mean, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me, but if I were to, if you had asked me which one would be more personal, I would have guessed that the civilian life would be more personal. No, um, though I it's exactly the op- exactly the opposite. Um, now, the teams that I lead, um, you know, and the folks that work for me now, they all know that uh, I'm interested, and I'm going to know your wife's name, and you're going to tell me about your family, and you're going to tell me what you like to do when you're not at Penske, mm-hmm. and we're going to talk about that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, you know, the other, the second big thing was this whole idea of going from, as I told you, formally very formal hierarchical to flat friendly collaborative. In fact, and it's one of, you know, in my first, I guess my second year with the company, when I first became a vice president, I participated in a leader development program at Wharton uh, that the company runs every couple of years for new officers of the company. And and as part of that, I did a 360 assessment. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, the, uh, you know, I graded out really high in all the numerical kind of stuff, but the comments, you know, the, the freelance kind of comments mm-hmm. that you can make were very interesting and insightful for me because, you know, I came from a world where I worked non-deployed. I worked 80 to 90 hours a week right. and the culture was, you're always on, you know, you, your Blackberry was on your nightstand. And if it went off in the middle of the night, you better check it because right. somebody was expecting you to answer them. Our culture is not quite like that. And I lead businesses that run 24 7 365 but we don't we're not of that same ilk mm-hmm. and the comments people had about me was you know pete goes awfully fast <laughs> and and i thought i had slowed down and i still think i've slowed down about a billion <laughs> percent from army pete huh. but it was i you know the pace at which i was running was still faster than kind of our established norm and you know as a third-party logistics provider we work hard and we're you know but it was so pace was a big and intensity and having to ratchet back um that you know to be more collaborative right right to be a little more friendly um it took and it forced me to learn and to adapt and, and I think it made me a better leader. And it's what I sought, right? Uh, I wanted, I did not want to stay in the defense sector. I wanted to do something new that would cause me to have to grow. Nice. I'm curious about in that, that growth, there are probably, and we could talk about this both in the military and the civilian, um, biggest mistakes you've made at some point in your, let's start with the army. It, at some point in your leadership career in the army, as you were going through these different levels, there were things that you did that you realized in retrospect, oh my God, if I'd known what I know now, I never would have handled it that way. What's the biggest mistake as a leader from a leadership perspective you made as a, as, as an officer and what did you learn? Yeah, I, I think it really comes, um, I could probably, we could probably talk for three hours on specific <laughs> examples, but it really comes to assuming something that wasn't true. Mm. And sometimes that comes from, um, you, you know, I, I always believe that you trust your subordinates implicitly and, but you trust and verify, right? So mm-hmm. you start a relationship on trust and that subordinate has to earn it every day. And, but sometimes we assume something to be true and it wasn't. Um, and, and I, more than once in the military, I made an assumption about something that one of my subordinates or a subordinate unit did or said they did that was untrue or partially true Mm -hmm. that resulted in um, us not meeting a standard, right? Or me personally as a leader failing to meet a standard. 
Um, I, you know, in Penske, I, I'll give you an example. I, I made an assumption my second or third year as a vice president, right when I moved to Texas, uh, I was involved. We won some new business and starting up a new business is um, it's hard. Uh, you got a your customer you don't know. You're hiring new people, the whole um, well, I, I had a fairly new direct report leader who was newer to the company than I was, very experienced in the industry, but new to the company, had never started a business like this. Um, I assumed some things that he knew. Mm-hmm. I did not pay attention to some details that I should have. And the end result was we probably had the worst implementation in the history of the company. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. You. It, and then it snowballed, right? When... Um, a few things went wrong and then things snowballed and it took us six weeks to iron ourselves out um, and resulted in my boss and my boss's boss, the president of the company. Um, they got drug into it because um, it was with a very large customer. Wow. And, um, but it really related to, I assumed some things that I shouldn't have. Got it. Uh, you know, um, and so now you're so, more rigorous about checking well, on things. Yes, uh, particularly things that you might have less personal experience with. Right? Mm-hmm. So I, I was not at a point where some of the things that I made assumptions about that I knew well enough. And I should have asked some harder questions. I should have dug in a little deeper. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. And the end result was, um, fortunately, I work for such, such an awesome company that, you know, our, and I tell folks all the time, and this goes back to values, right? So, you know, we have three kind of um, underpinning values for in Penske. You know, we call passionately personal people, right? Dedicated to excellence mm-hmm. and value fresh thinking, you know, kind of our bedrock. Um, and I, I, I work for leadership who uh, I've messed some things up big time. And every time that's happened, what they they look at me and say, well, Pete, what's your plan? Then the next thing is, how can I help you? And then the third is, I trust you. Wow. And never once have I felt that, uh, you know, because in some organizations you would get the, hey, you have 30 days to fix this or you're out <laughs> type of, whether it's specified or implied. Never, and it's a reinforcement of our values. We know we have the right person here. You made a mistake. You've owned up to it. What's your plan? And then how can I help you? Um, and I, you know, I try to replicate that because that's pretty powerful. There's a fundamental that we teach in almost all of our companies, and it's it aligns with that. And we call it practice blameless problem solving. Yeah. And and the, we always say that the when a problem happens, the first thing that matters is. What are we going to do to fix it? Second thing that matters is what do we learn from it? And the third thing that matters is after we see what we learn, how are we in- incorporating that learning into some process improvement so that we reduce the chance of repeating that mistake? And the only thing I'd probably put in front of your first is, mm-hmm. and it goes to my, you know, the way I grew up as an army or, or an army leader in our values is if the organization I lead made a mistake, I own it personally as a mm-hmm. leader. And I use those words and it's, you know, that the way I was raised is the only time it's appropriate to use the I word is when we have not met a standard when right. there's success credit. Goes to the team. Right. So let me ask you this last question. Um, I'm always curious uh, anybody who has achieved some level of success and, and I, and I, I'll, I would define success broadly, whether it's somebody is a great receptionist or they're the president of the company or they're a great musician or anything that they have gotten good at. For all of us who've gotten good at something, there's a point at which we look back and think, wow, if I, again, if I knew this when I was younger, or maybe said another way, if I was talking to somebody who was new at this, they were whether they were a young soldier or they're a young leader in civilian life. And I was giving them, you know, the biggest piece of wisdom that I wish I had had when I was younger at this. What's that piece of wisdom? What, what have you learned that if you were to capsulize it all and pass it to a young leader in civilian life, let's say, what's the biggest piece of wisdom you'd give them? Uh, I, I think it's be humble. When I think about uh, my success, it's because 
people chose to invest in me and in many times, uh, some of the most powerful things I learned as a leader, I learned from my subordinates. Mm. And particularly as a younger officer, even as a senior officer, the non-commissioned officer corps in the United States Army, they more than anyone are responsible for turning me into the leader that I became. And, and they were all subordinate to me. Right? I mean, from the moment I was commissioned as a second lieutenant, I outranked every non-commissioned officer, including the most senior non-commissioned officer in the Army, who would be the sergeant major of the Army. Um, as a second lieutenant, I outranked him. Didn't mean I was smarter than him and didn't mean I knew more. Mm -hmm. So it's right. this idea of being, um, you know, be a servant leader and have humility. And being a servant leader means you truly are in service to others. Right. And one of the ways you can be in being humble enough to learn from your subordinates. And that's a hard thing. And I have found even in my second opportunity here with Penske, most of my learning, and I've worked for two phenomenal uh, leaders, um, most of what I've learned, I've learned from subordinates. You know, I had no idea how to price a warehouse deal. Um, no, I, I didn't. But I learned that from people who are subordinate to me on my team. So humility. And then I, the other thing I tell them is never stop learning. Because right? mm -hmm. as you know, some people get to a point in life where they just say, all right, I'm good. All right. I, I don't need to learn anymore. When in fact, you can always learn something. I, we were doing a uh, a podcast episode recently, and one of the people we were speaking with had had some experience with the CEO of of Microsoft, and he said something I thought was interesting that relates to what you're describing. And he said that at Microsoft, in their current culture, which he thinks very highly of, they talk about rather than than being a know it all, they call it being a learn it all, and mm -hmm. having this idea of instead of a bunch of people who think they know everything, having a bunch of people who constantly are learning, who always want to learn more. I thought that was an interesting phrase, a learn it all. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I've, I've done with the team here as a private sector leader is I hire for attributes, not experience. Mm -hmm. And the more senior you are as a leader, less experience matters. It's more about attributes. And, and we've developed and the company has adopted it, this kind of what we call best a, a picture of a best athlete, right? Attributes for a best athlete. Mm -hmm. um, and learning is one of those attributes. Are you a learner? Um, because that's an indicator of someone who, who grows. And not yeah. only if you're a personal learner, that means you, you bring that to your teams. Fascinating. So Pete, I really appreciate a lot of incredible insights from your both military and civilian life. And and leadership and culture. If people wanted to learn more about you, your background, get in touch with you, how would people do that? Um, I, I don't know that I'm all that interesting, but if folks <laughs> wanted to reach out to me. There's that humility. Uh, yeah. Um, probably the easiest way is through my personal email, uh, which is blackhorse, one word, 61 at iCloud.com. Uh, and that comes from, I was the 61st Colonel of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, and we wow. were known, known as the Black Horse Regiment. Got so, it. Black Horse 61 at iCloud.com. Great. Well, thank you again, Pete. This has been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you joining me on the podcast. David, I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity. Thank you. Ah, uh, you're welcome. Now, his name is Peter Bayer, the Senior Vice President of Operations at Penske Logistics. And that's it for another episode of Culture Architects. If you're enjoying this show, make sure you take a second to subscribe so that whenever I drop a new show, you'll know about it right away. Also, if you have a minute, I would love it if you just leave us a review so that more folks like you can discover the show. I'll see you next time on Culture Architects. This has been Culture Architects with David J. Friedman. Be sure to join us next time for more insights and wisdom from great leaders from all walks of life. To book David for your events or to learn more about his writing, speaking, or consulting, go to davidjfriedman.com. Culture Architects with David J. Friedman is a production of Forbes Books.